Morning guys, Chris is coming over this morning on his cool Norton Commando. I think we might hear him arrive before we see him. Here he is. Morning, Chris. How you doing, Mike? Good, nice to see you again. Good to see you. <laughs> I heard you coming from the next block. From the next block over? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, well. Oh, it sounds awesome. I love the sound of your bike. Yeah, it sounds great. You remember the, the time where the muffler fell off? I do. When we showed up to the club ride. I do. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Chris, for coming. Yeah. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. It's a beautiful day to be for a ride. It is, isn't it? Yeah. And it yeah. sounds great when you come up that cul-de-sac. <laughs> <laughs> it always does. We always know when you're coming to the club meeting. I kind of <laughs> worry that it might be a little too loud, but I just try not to ride before 6 a.m. Uh, well, can, can you tell us a bit about your bike, how long you've had it and so forth? Yeah, yeah. This is a 1973 Commando 750. I bought it in around 2003. I had uh, been riding a Japanese bike and found it just kind of boring and one day I was rolling off the throttle and I looked down and I was coming down past 95 miles an hour and thought I'm going too fast and I'm not getting any enjoyment. This is kind of blasé. I need something that's engaging. Found Ken Armin British Cycles down in San Jose, California and started hanging around his shop and he kind of coached me, nudged me towards Norton. My dad had BSAs and and a variety of different triumphs and things. Ah. And so uh, I started looking for a Norton and I knew I wanted a cafe racer. And this is long before the cafe racer scene really hit and it was cool. I was searching the internet for whatever I could find. And there was a guy up in Vancouver, British Columbia that oh, yeah. was a reseller. Uh, and he was reselling a variety of different bikes, including this one. And I asked around the uh, local scene down in San Jose, uh, Raber's Parts Mart down there. Yes. Talked to, uh, I think it was Richard and a couple of the other guys down at Raber's, and they said, you know, uh, that, that Robin Mullet, he's a good guy. You can trust him. The bikes are what they seem. And uh, I somehow convinced my wife, with <laughs> our uh, two year old son at the time, <laughs> to let me uh, buy this bike, cash, sight unseen. Oh, really? And. Uh, yeah, the guy decided that uh, in order to help sell it, he offered to be my customs broker, and he crated it and got it across the line and got it on a truck. And uh, I watched, this is before we had real-time tracking for local carriers and such, and I knew it was coming in, and it was a Friday afternoon, and I was worried I wasn't gonna be able to get there on time, and so I ran down, I left work early, and I, I went down and I rented our little box van, yeah. and I drove up to the, through, through all the rush hour traffic, and got there about half an hour before the docks closed in, in, at the Oakland port. And I picked my bike up, and I got back home through all the same traffic, and you know, after two hours sitting in traffic, yeah. I throw the doors open and I pull the thing out onto the lift gate and my two-year-old decides he's got to sit on this thing. Oh, and so yeah. I've got this great picture of him beaming on top of this thing. Turns out the guy that uh, was selling it decided to move into Harley's and he had gotten tired of putting all of his money into Norton's. He had put an Axtel 4S cam and uh, the rims and you know really gone through it and fixed everything up that needed to be fixed including uh, putting the hide rear sets and uh, it came in pretty well done but it had not been shaken down and so my first few rides were shaking all of the fasteners <laughs> loose that hadn't been loctited in place and started <laughs> holding the parts together i will never forget it was about a week into ownership and i was sitting at a traffic light this is about nine o'clock at night and i had just learned the starting sequence and the ticklers and gotten it to run and one of the ticklers stuck open and just started gushing fuel all over the place. Oh no. As I'm sitting at a traffic light about three blocks from the house. And I thought, oh boy, Here we I'm go. not even a week into this thing and it's gonna catch into a <laughs> ball of fire underneath my crotch. This is this is not a good sign. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, I lived with the Amels for a while and the you know, the slides are rattling around and I yeah. finally decided it's time to upgrade. And I'd spent a lot of time down with Ken Armin. He was helping me with bits and pieces. And he uh, sold me a, a Makuni 36 millimeter carb 
that had been all jetted. That really made it start beautifully and idle beautifully. You know, it, it runs really strong from about 3,500 RPM oh. on up to about 7,500. And uh, I decided that it's old. Stock red line was at seven. You know, it's got the right crank and pistons and stuff to take a little higher, but it's been fairly reliable once I got all of the vibrating parts to stop falling off. So about every year or two, I'll do a little something here and there, but by and large, I got it where I want it to be, and I just ride the snot out of it. Brilliant. And uh, you know, there's little little bits and pieces like the ethanol and the fuel starting to get to the uh, fiberglass in the in the tank. Yeah. My understanding is this is a uh, original production racer tank. Okay. And it's still got the yellow gel coat. Oh, has it really? Yeah. And I don't know if this is a tail section that's been sliced, but uh, it's a good match. And I didn't like the frame loop in the back, so I found the documentation, the production racer kit. Instructions said to cut the loop, turn it 90 degrees and weld it back on. So I did that, and so it's got plenty of support in the back. And then I made a little bracket here, and I took one of the uh, Lucas taillights, turned it upside down, and tucked it back up inside here. I like and that. And I trimmed the bottom of it so the LEDs that uh, I put a retrofit LED taillight kit. Very nice. So it lights up the license plate nicely. And did you know about the Norman Hyde parts then when you were looking at the bike? Is that what appealed <clears throat> to you then? Something that always strikes me when I see your bike is you've got quite a few Norman Hyde parts which are really cool, aren't they? You know, I didn't know anything about oh. Norman Hyde until I got the bike. Oh, okay. And then a few people commented. I knew, you know, rear sets and it did not have clip-ons. So I went out and found Tomaselli clip-ons, because my dad used to always talk about Tomaselli clip-ons. That was the hot ticket. Yeah. He had a Rickman. It had all kinds of cafe racer provenance, but it was Japanese, and I decided I wanted to go even older and British. I've got a Norman Hyde front fork brace that I haven't put on yet. The warnings were that they're pretty tricky to get dialed in, and if you don't dial them in right, your forks, will, your telescopic forks will seize up at just the wrong moment. So. Oh, shoot. I've been thinking carefully about when I'm going to do a teardown, maybe this winter. And that two into one exhaust system, that's great, is that, isn't it? I like that a lot. Yeah, the story there is uh, it vibrated and cracked and fell apart, and the, uh, the head nuts had stripped out. And so I got uh, Phil Radford down at Fair Spares. Yeah, yes. I had him do the, uh, the exhaust threads, and then I went down to Bob Rabers and uh, they let me just walk through the aisles and pick out parts. Oh, jeez. And so I went around and I found the, the right new exhaust nuts and a couple of header pipes that looked like they'd fit. And I found a collector that was close enough. So I welded some bits and pieces together and shoved a cheap MGO stubby muffler on the end of it. Yeah. I think it might have been quieter. <laughs> when it still had packing in it. <laughs> That's all <laughs> long since blown yeah. out of the end yeah. of there. And the nickel frame as well, I really like that. It really lightens the bike, doesn't it, as well? Gives it a really cool look about it. My dad's Rickman had a nickel oh, frame, yeah. so I was partial. And I knew going in that the nickel doesn't really last that well, and it's really soft. If you bump it with a wrench, you'll chip it and all that stuff. But I just love the look and I don't like too much chrome. It's a little softer than the chrome, yeah. a little yellowish hue. So I, I really like it. A lot of people ask me if it's a Rickman or a Spondon or something like that. And I, no, no, it's just a stock frame. I had been uh, running the, the stock solid cast iron disc with this AP Racing magnesium caliper. And that combination with the stock master cylinder had about the feel during braking of a block of wood. <laughs> it was just nothing, nothing, nothing. <laughs> I'm an engineer, so I decided I was gonna adapt my own full floating disc brake. I found on eBay a uh, front disc from a Yamaha R1. And the R1 was the only one that I thought looked good enough to put on a British bike. It was a group of guys that met at a machine shop every Wednesday night. It was Tom Keeble and a bunch of old flat track racers would sit around bench racing and Tom would let people work on their side projects. Oh, brilliant. And so I got in his, you know, he had a, I don't know, eight foot long engine lathe and I sourced a block of 7075 aluminum and made my drawings in my CAD system and whittled away that aluminum for a couple of nights over a few weeks and made an adapter hub for the Brilliant. disc brake there. It's great that there's a, a strong community of bikers out there willing to help each other. Yeah. 
and as we get older I'm starting to see the the guys that bought these originally are starting yeah. to move on yes. and it's important that we kind of carry on the knowledge and, and help each other out and don't kick the new people that come into the sport let them learn be constructive and helpful it's always nice to to have somebody kind of lead you lead you along and I I've had a lot that. of people help me out so it handles absolutely beautifully I, I, I ride it hard and you know my dad put me on a bike when I was six years old and when he comes to visit and we ride around he says uh, you know that's an old bike you got to take it easy on that thing <laughs> and I thought well it's just barely faster than I am which is important you know if it was a <laughs> A modern rice rocket, I would have no qualms about doing things just stupid. You know, velocity squared, energy, there's, you, the faster you go, the more energy there is to break your bones when you fall. So <laughs> this thing keeps me engaged. It, uh, you know, long, heavy clutch pull and big, long travel on the, on the uh, GP pattern shifter. And, uh, but it's, it's a lot of fun and I've never been in a place where I wish it was way faster. My dad keeps telling me I should take the time to get it restored. And I thought, well, right now I have to ride it. And if I did that, it would cost me $4,000 in probably two riding seasons. It would. I need to just ride. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Chris. Good it was really you, good to see you and hear your bike more importantly as well. I can never remember, is it keep the shiny side up or the sticky side down? <laughs> the rubber side down. very much for watching guys this has been another tale from the cul-de-sac please remember to subscribe and click the little bell and you'll get a notice whenever I release a new video usually every Sunday morning and sometimes during the week